Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our second keynote speaker, Dr. Joshua Tan. Dr. Tan is a Stenman Tenure Track Investigator and an NIH Distinguished Scholar in the Divisions of Intramural Research and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He received his PhD from the University of Oxford in England. Prior to joining the NIH, he was awarded the Pfizer Research Prize for his malaria work and the Sir Welcome Postdoctoral Fellowship to investigate human monoclonal antibodies that target Plasmodium falciparum. These are just some of the many highlights in his professional career. We're excited to hear about your research, Dr. Tan, and thank you so much for joining us today. All right, uh, well, thanks for the introduction, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Today, I'm going to talk about um, and monoclonal antibodies against Plasmodium falciparum. But before I get into that, uh, you know, while well, well, we're all still digesting our lunch, I'm going to start with a, a thought experiment that illustrates the type of work that we do. Right, so imagine that you're an ant researcher instead of researching malaria. And one day, the world famous uh, ant researcher, Dr. Anthony, invites you uh, to, to a, a challenge where uh, so he says that he's holding the first ever ant wrestling competition and he has 10 rooms that are full of ants. And he knows that out of these 10 rooms, one ant in the millions of ants in these rooms is the strongest ant of them all, right? And so he wants you to find this ant. Now he'll give you all the tools that you need uh, to assess the strength of these ants. Uh, and he'll give you three days to find the strongest ant. And not just to find the ant, but since you're a scientist, tell him why this particular ant, ant is the strongest one. Right? And says, all right, if you uh, <laughs> succeed in three days, then I'll, I'll give you a chest of gold. Right? So you accept the challenge and you open one of the doors with a little bit of nervousness. And so this is what you see when you enter the room. Right? And you wonder, how in the world am I going to find one ant out of a million? Right, so thankfully we don't have to answer that question today since I don't study ants, right? I study antibodies. Uh, but the concept of why I described is similar to what we're trying to do uh, when we study monoclonal antibodies, right? So ant antibodies traditionally have been studied at the polyclonal level where there is a mixture of many, many different antibodies. And so for example, we screen serum or we screen plasma um, from someone who's been infected or vaccinated, uh, and we try to look for antibody responses against a specific target, right? And this gives us a lot of useful information, but in many ways, this is an average of the response of that individual uh, to that target. Now, in recent years, uh, improvements in technology have allowed us to study single antibodies produced by single B cells, or in other words, monoclonal antibodies, and not just a few antibodies produced by a few B cells, but many different antibodies produced by many different B cells. And this is interesting because antibodies, each individual antibody is very different from its counterparts, right? Um, for example, if we try to scale antibodies in a range of protectiveness against a given target like SARS-CoV-2 or Plasmodium falciparum, uh, some antibodies will be very protective, some uh, will have no effect, probably most of them will have no effect, they'll be neutral, and there could be some that are even harmful uh, in rare cases of antibody-dependent enhancement of the disease. So what uh, my lab is interested in is we are interested in studying uh, the most protective or the most functional antibodies. And what I mean by functional protective could be two things. Uh, one, it is very potent against the pathogen, for example, an antibody that neutralizes SARS-CoV-2 very well, or it could be an antibody that's very broad in its function. Uh, for example, an antibody that targets many different strains of Plasmodium falciparum, uh, which is one of the examples that I'll come to later. So one of the main questions that we ask is, uh, what are the features of a functional or a protective antibody response? So what makes the best antibodies the best, right? Is it, um, 
vGen usage. So is it a, a sequence that predisposes it to bind and function well? Is it the level of somatic mutations, right, which antibodies go through as part of the development, but uh, they increase the affinity for a given target? Uh, is it where it binds on the target protein, the epitope, that's uh, the most important feature? And so we, we examine all this. Uh, and a, a second question that we ask, which is very closely related to the first question is, uh, what are the targets of the best yeah. antibodies? Right. So what, what are the best proteins to target? But more than that, what are the best epitope to target? And we try to, to okay. get in as much detail as possible down to the single amino acid level. Right. And to answer the second question, we are very fond of using antigen agnostic approaches, meaning that at the start, we don't restrict ourselves to any specific antigen. Uh, for example, if you're interested in finding antibodies that target plasmodium falciparum sporozoids, we would screen for antibodies that bind to sporozoites without uh, considering what, what protein we're looking at at the start. And then we use the antibodies as tools to identify the target antigens downstream. Right? And so this gives us at least the opportunity to find a new target antigen suspection candidates. So you can imagine that uh, answering these questions lends itself to more translational areas of research. Right. For example, the most potent monoclonal antibodies can be investigated for use in preventing or treating disease, as right. been seen for COVID-19. And the best targets, the best epitopes, the best antigens can be considered as a new candidates for vaccine design. So my lab uses uh, this approach to study antibodies against different pathogens, uh, but the one that I've been studying the longest is Plasmodium falciparum, and we're very interested in antibodies against malaria. Right. And uh, one of the main reasons we're interested is that we know that antibodies can protect against different stages of uh, the parasite life cycle. Right. And we, we know this from uh, a body of evidence that spans uh, more than 60 years. So, for example, this is a classical study that's often used uh, to, to illustrate this point. So here, antibodies were given uh, to uh, children in the Gambia. And it was found that once antibodies were given, so these were antibodies from uh, immune adults uh, that per the parasite burden decreased and, and fever uh, decreased over time as well. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have a much more recent example. Uh, this is a, a paper recently published by Bob Cedar's group. Uh, and here they uh, describe an antibody, a monoclonal antibody called CIS-43LS. And basically this antibody was given to uh, nine individuals who were then challenged uh, uh, with sporozoids, and it was found that all nine individuals were sterilely protected from malaria. Right, so there's a, a lot of evidence uh, suggesting that antibodies play a role uh, in malaria. And today I'm going to talk about uh, antibodies, monoclonal antibodies targeting two different stages of the life cycle, uh, the trophozoite schizone stage as well as the sporozoite stage. Right, I'll draw from examples uh, that are both from previous work as well as more current work to uh, illustrate the type of work that we carry out in the labs. All right, so I'm going to start with the blood stage. So the infected red blood cell stage is a quite an interesting stage of the life cycle since when the parasite invades, uh, it invades into the red cell, but then it exports proteins to the surface of the infected red cell. Right? And, and many of these proteins uh, can be classified as very surface antigens because they belong to large multi-gene families uh, and some of the most famous uh, families include PFEMP1, Riffins, and Stevors, right? And the variability of these antigens is such that there is diversity not just between different parasite strains or isolates, but even within uh, a single uh, parasite isolate. And this is due to the, the multigenic nature of, of these, these families. So we were interested in trying to find broadly reactive antibodies uh, against the surface. and so. Uh, we use an assay called the mixed agglutination assay to uh, screen plasma from Kenyan adults for broadly reactive antibodies against this target. And so what we, we did here is we stained uh, parasites with different uh, from three different isolates uh, with different DNA binding dyes. We mix them together with one adult plasma such that if the plasma has variant specific antibodies, we will see these single color agglutinates. But if the plasma has uh, broadly reactive antibodies, you will see uh, these multicolored agglutinates. And so uh, what we found is that the vast majority of plasma only 
uh, could form this single color deglutinate, suggesting that they only um, have very specific antibodies, but a few plasma, specifically uh, four out of 557, so it's a very rare phenotype to form these large multicolored agglutinates. And so this is, again, at the polyclonal level, and so we wanted to go deeper into the monoclonal level to try to isolate monoclonal antibodies from these individuals. And so uh, we carried out a workflow to try to get monoclonals. Uh, first, we obtained PBMCs from individuals of interest, and then we immortalized these cells with the antibodies, and then we played them out pretty much clonally uh, in 3 4 well plates. They are secreting antibodies, and then we screen the supernatants for binding to infected red cells by flow cytometry. And then once we identify B cell clones of interest, we pull them out, uh, we isolate RNA from these B cells, we do RT-PCR, and then we uh, obtain the heavy and light changing sequences, which then allows us to make the monoclonals as recombinant IgG, uh, and then we can essentially make uh, unlimited amounts of these antibodies. So using this approach, we identified uh, a panel of antibodies that are broadly reactive to uh, different parasite isolates. You can see here, uh, my mouse, I can't see my mouse, but well, most of them are broadly reactive except the three at the bottom, which were uh, parasite specific. And so when we looked at the ones that were broadly reactive, uh, we found that they did not have a classical IgG structure, which for the heavy chain uh, consists of a V, a D, and a J gene, uh, all recombined. But instead, they had a large insert of more than uh, 300 base pairs in between the V and the J of the heavy chain. right? And this insert comes from a gene called LAR1, which encodes an inhibitor receptor on chromosome 19, uh, which is a different chromosome from where the heavy chain is encoded on chromosome 14. So somehow this piece of DNA had jumped from a different chromosome into this chromosome and then became a, a part of the antibody, right? And so the structure of this antibody now looks like what is on the right uh, compared to the more classical IgG structure on the left. So when we looked at the sequences of these monoclonal antibodies, we found uh, when we focused on the, the layer one insert, which is uh, shown in red, we found that the insert did not have exactly the same sequence as the original chromosome 19 layer one, which you can see at the bottom, but instead there were mutations in this insert. So this really suggested that the insert has had pretty much made itself at home in the antibody. It acted as part of the antibody. It underwent somatic mutations like the rest of the antibody during the germinal center uh, reaction. Right, and this uh, shown here is just one example antibody, MGD21. But we found uh, basically that all the broadly reactive antibodies from two donors that we looked at, all of them had this mutated layer one insert while the three uh, parasite-specific antibodies at the bottom, these did not have the insert, right? So the obvious question to ask was, is this mutated layer one insert responsible for this broad reactivity? And uh, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all the steps that we took, but basically the answer is yes, right? That we found that this insert is important. You take it out, you stick it on the FC, you'll find that it works against the parasite. If you remove it from the antibody, then the antibody no longer has reactivity to uh, the infected red blood cells. So next we wanted to identify the target antigens uh, of these layer one containing antibodies. And uh, once again, I'm not gonna go through the, the data in detail, but basically we used IP, uh, immunoprecipitation and mass spec to identify uh, members of the Rifin variant antigen family uh, as targets of these layer one containing antibodies. So at this stage, we had identified layer one containing antibodies from one village in Kenya, and we wanted to find out if they could be found more broadly in different malaria endemic areas, or is it something where lightning struck one particular village, right? And so we screened samples uh, from two other countries, uh, Mali and Tanzania, in collaboration uh, with a few different groups. And we developed uh, an assay to screen plasma from these samples for the presence of layer one containing antibodies. It's a two determinant bead based assay, similar in principle to an ELISA. Right? And what we found is that uh, quite a decent percentage of individuals li living in these areas have these layer one containing antibodies, between 5 to 10%. 
right? Uh, you can see here, like Tanzania about five, while Mali was closer to 10. And so finding more donors who had these level one containing antibodies allowed us to try to isolate more monoclonals from these individuals. And so we went on to do so. And we found more antibodies that had this form that I described earlier, this so-called classical layer one containing antibody form. But we also found some antibodies where the insert was after the variable domain. So in between the variable and the CH1, where it looks very similar to the first one in terms of where it is, but it does result in quite a big difference in the structure because now it is the layer one inserts after the variable domain. So we call this an insertion in the elbow. Um, and from one individual, we found an even more bizarre form of this antibody where large deletions in the genome, basically it wiped out the CH1, it wiped out a lot of the variable domain, and essentially it resulted in a camelid form of a layer one containing antibody, where the only part that binds the target, the variable part is layer one. Uh, in this case, so it took the and it's very similar uh, to antibodies that are made by camels and llamas. Right. So to yes. summarize so far, we found uh, layer one containing antibodies where layer one is an inhibitor receptor that targets RIFINs on infected red cells, and it was shown more recently that RIFINs also bind to another inhibitor receptor also from chromosome nineteen uh, called little B one. Right. And so we wanted to find out if people can also make little B1 containing antibodies. So is it just unique to layer one or are there other proteins, other, other pieces of DNA that can insert into the antibody structure? And so uh, we screened plasma again from the Malian cohort for the presence of these antibodies using the same type of assay that I described. Uh, so this work was really uh, led by Yi Wei Chen, a PhD student in my former lab. And uh, what she found is that there were a few individuals who appeared to have layer B1 containing antibodies, right? So rarer, it seems to be rarer than the layer ones, but it still seems to be there. And then when she did sequencing of some of the monoclonal antibodies from these individuals, she found, I'm not sure if it's more bizarre than the camel one, but it's pretty unusual for an antibody as well, right? So. Here, there are two domains that got inserted into the antibody structure, not one, as in the case of layer one. And two domains caused the, the, the variable part to stretch pretty much because there's no room to fit it, such that it forms this triangular structure instead of a more normal structure like, like this, right? And so this is not just our imagination. We didn't just imagine this, this form. Uh, we actually have the structures. Of, of these antibodies, right? And so if you look at the one on the left, so the one on the left was solved by Matt Higgins group, right? It is the so-called classical layer one VDJ, where you can see the insert, the layer one insert is positioned nicely on top of uh, the variable domain. So it doesn't really disrupt the original structure too much. But then the one on the right is, is this new uh, little B1 insert. You can see it really does form pretty much a triangular uh, variable domain and the CH1, right? And so this is interesting because there's a lot of effort nowadays, uh, especially from companies to try to design different forms of bispecific antibodies or nanobodies or just antibodies that have inserts all over the place to try to increase uh, the potency of monoclonals, right? And so this shows that, you know, whatever we can think of, like nature has already designed some of these really unusual structures. Right, so to uh, conclude this section, we found an unusual insertion of layer one that generates broadly reactive antibodies to infected red cells. Uh, we found that the insert is responsible for the reactivity. Uh, we've also found little b1 containing antibodies uh, that also bind to refins. And we found that uh, the layer one and, the, and this little b1 and, uh, can insert at different locations, resulting in different uh, forms of antibodies. All right, I'm gonna move on now to talk about a second stage, the sporozoite stage. And here we were interested in using the antigen agnostic approach that I described earlier, right? To, to try to find antibodies that target sporozoites, right? And 
we knew that, well, a lot of it was probably going to be CSP. You know, we've heard this morning that CSP is even a dominant um, sporozoite surface, but we were especially interested in trying to find other antigens besides CSP that could be on the sporozoite surface and could be targets of the antibody response. And so we started uh, by screening samples from Tanzanian adults who were immunized with the Sanaria PFSPZ vaccine, and then they were challenged to have live sporozoites. And so some individuals uh, in this cohort were protected, some were not. And so we went on to isolate monoclonal antibodies from the protected individuals using the same type of workflow that I described earlier. Right, so to, to cut a long story short, we identified nine monoclonal antibodies that bind to sporozoites. Right, uh, and they, I'm showing you five here, uh, along with a negative control uh, BKC3, but basically all of them look quite similar in, in terms of uh, how they bind to, to the sporozoites. And so next, we wanted to find out what the target was, since at this stage, all we knew is that they bind to the surface of sporozoites. And fortunately or unfortunately, all of them bound to the circumsporozoite protein, right? Which perhaps is not the right <laughs> in hindsight, but honestly, we were hoping for something else, right? And I think CSP has already been explained well uh, this, this morning, right? So we know that CSP coats the surface. It is immunodominant. Uh, it is important for the function of sporozoites. And RTSS, which has been mentioned earlier, uh, uses a part of CSP, but it only uses this part here uh, from, from the, the middle of the NEMP repeats to, to the end of the C terminus. So now that we had monoclonal antibodies against CSP, we decided to go on and characterize them both in terms of function and their epitope. And for function, uh, we use this FRG HUHEP mouse model where uh, the mice have humanized livers to allow infection by plasmodium falciparum sporozoites. And the sporozoites also carry luciferase, so this allows imaging uh, of liver burden six days after infection. Right? So what we do is we inject the antibodies first, and then a day later, uh, we infect them by mosquito bite, and then uh, six days after that, we image the mice to look at liver burden. So these are the results of the um, antibody screen. The nine antibodies are shown here, and you can see that there's a wide range of potency. Right? So here, the lower the bar, the better the antibody. So some antibodies like MGG4 and MG12 were pretty good in reducing uh, liver burden. And so we wanted to find out why these antibodies were uh, different in terms of potency, since they all bind, bind well to sporozoites, we know they all bind to CSP. And so we went on to map uh, the epitopes, the target epitopes of these nine antibodies, right? And uh, the results are shown here. So these nine are the ones that I've described, right? These are the ones that we tested in the mouse model, uh, the ones in the, in the black box. And we can see that all nine target the NEMP repeat regions in the middle of CSP. But the five uh, more potent antibodies also target and by, by what I mean by potent is they reduce liver burden to less than 10%. Uh, they also targeted this NPDP15 peptide, which is located at the junction between the N terminus and the repeat region. So this is seen more clearly if you look at it in two dimensions, where the top five antibodies are, they cluster at the bottom left where they have a, a low EC50 for binding to this NPDP15 peptide, and they also have lower liver burden compared to the other four. Right, so this suggests that the most potent antibodies, uh, they display dual binding. They bind both to the junction and to the NMP repeat uh, region of CSP. Right, and so we uh, published this back to back with Bob Cedar's group, which had independently found an antibody called cis 3 which I mentioned at the start, uh, a potent antibody that targets uh, the junctional site as well. Right? So a very similar epitope to the ones that we found. Right, and as I mentioned, cis 3 uh, is now in clinical trials. So this was interesting, right? We found potent antibodies against CSP, but I was still a little bit dissatisfied because we didn't find some, any non-CSP antibodies. And so we decided to restart and try again to find monoclonal antibodies that bind to sporozoites, but don't target CSP, right? And so Sherelle, a, a postdoc in the lab, uh, briefly agreed to take on this project, right? And so this time we said, all right, we're going, to, we're not just going to start blind, we're going to actively work to avoid CSP, 
right? We're going to try to block out uh, antibodies to CSV. And so we started with uh, a group of about 900 individuals, right? Since we thought, you know, this might be a rare response. So let's try to screen as many as we can. And we screen plasma from these individuals and they consist of both uh, individuals who were naturally exposed to malaria. So from Mali, as well as individuals from the US who were vaccinated with uh, the irradiated sporozoa, as I mentioned earlier. Right, so we uh, screened these 900 individuals for binding to sporozoites. And first, we just looked at simple IgG binding from the plasma to sporozoites, and we found a wide range in reactivity. Right, so some individuals had pretty much 100% reactivity to sporozoites, some had close to 0%. So then we repeated this screen, but this time we pre-blocked the plasma with recombinant CSP. Right? And then we added this pre-blocked plasma to the sporozoites such that only antibodies that are not blocked, so non-CSP antibodies, could bind to the sporozoites. And this is the result. Right? Right. So you can see a, a very stark difference between uh, the two. Right? And this suggests that CSP really is immunodominant uh, on the sporozoite surface. Most of these individuals lost reactivity completely uh, after the plasma was blocked with CSP. Right? But we did find a few rare individuals who still had some reactivity to sporozoites even after uh, their CSP antibodies were blocked. And so we went on to try to isolate monoclonal antibodies from these individuals. So here we decided to use a slightly different screen from what I described earlier to isolate monoclonals we decided to do it in two steps in order to increase our chances of finding very rare antibodies, right? And so what we did is we sorted uh, B cells from the, the vaccines or the malians. We activated them using a cocktail of cytokines. Uh, and then our first step was we screened them uh, oligoclonally. So 50 cells per well in three to four well plates. And we screened the supernatants for binding to sporozoites and CSP. And then in the second step, we took the wells that were positive, uh, we pulled the B cells from those wells, and then we put them in a device called the beacon, uh, which I'll come back to later. And there we screen them at a single B cell level. And once again, we screen for uh, binding to both sporozoites and CSP. All right, so uh, I'm showing you some sample results of the oligoclonal screens, the first step. There were three main outcomes that we observed right, uh, from the supernatants. The first and the most common outcome is that the supernatants were double negative. So they were negative for sporozoites, they were negative for CSP. Okay. So in the plots there, uh, on top we have sporozoites, and if they are to the left, they're negative. So as seen there, and at the bottom, we have different populations of beads that have either CSP or different parts of CSP, uh, as shown by the red labels. labels. And the, the beads on the left, those are recombinant CSP. So if it's at the bottom, it means that there's no reactivity to CSP, right? So these are double negative. The next most common outcome is what's a double positive, right? So these are supernatants that bind to both sporozoites and CSP. You can see the sporozoites are shifted to the right and CSP beads, which are the ones to, to the left most are, they have gone up. And the third outcome, which is what we were really interested in, uh, was supernatants that bind to sporozoites, but there's no reactivity to CSP or any part of CSP. Right? So these were what we considered positives, and the, uh, these were also what we took forward to the next screen. Right? And so the next screen uh, uses a device called a beacon, and the heart of a beacon is a chip that's roughly the size of a tea bag. Uh, and it contains about 11,000 nanopans. Right? And the volume of each pen is 0.25 nanoliters. And so I see this works. All right, so uh, what the beacon does is it draws cages of light around B cells. And when the light hits, the chip is converted into an electrical charge that then repels B cells, and then it moves them into their respective pens. Right? And so this is an example from one uh, B cell, but what happens during an actual run is that the beacon will draw uh, cages of light around many different B cells and it will push them all into their respective pens. And each pen is numbered and barcoded so we know uh, at the end of this whether uh, each pen has zero, one, or more than one cell. Uh, but the goal here is to get one B cell per pen. Right? 
Now, because the volume of each pen is so small, we can rapidly do a screen of these B cells for secretion of antibodies of interest, right? Basically, we can start the, 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 the test run immediately after their pen. So within minutes, they start secreting enough antibodies to be able to be detected in an assay, right? And so what we do is we flood in sporozoites uh, as well as fluorescently labeled secondary antibody. And so if a B cell makes an antibody of interest, it will bind to the sporozoites, the secondary will bind, and then the sporozoites will light up over time. So to show you what it actually looks like in practice, if you focus on the, the what we call pens, these are like tiny wells that are highlighted in yellow, you can see that the sporozoites, um, they light up over time. Right? And so this video was, was a time lapse that was shot over half an hour. So you can see that by, within half an hour, there's enough signal to be able to detect B cells of interest. So once we run the screen, uh, we then run a counter screen after this on the same B cells in the same chip, but this time we screen with CSP coated beads, right? So we replace the sporozoites with beads. Uh, and so we choose only pens that are positive in the first screen, but then negative in the second screen to the CSP coated beads. So hopefully these are antibodies that bind to sporozoites, but not CSP. Right, and so we isolated a total of 11 recombinant antibodies that, uh, as you can see here, using this approach, uh, they all bind to sporozoites. Uh, these, these antibodies are in blue, and the control antibodies is for a tree, which is a CSP antibody is in red. Uh, you can see that many of the antibodies uh, bind well, right? Some of them bind as well as an antibody to CSP. And these antibodies do not bind to recombinant CSP. You now you can see that some of them have reactivity when you go to really high concentration, but normally we consider that background uh, if the antibody is a bit sticky, right? But none of them bound uh, nearly as well as cis poetry, uh, for example. So, so far so good. You know, we seem to have isolated antibodies that target sporozoites, but don't bind to CSP. Uh, but this is where the, the confusion started, right? So, we wanted to try to find out what the target antigen was. And one of the things we did was a Western blot. And we did a Western blot on sporozoite lysate. And you can see here that uh, two of our antibodies were chosen, MET21101 and 2238. These are two new antibodies. And as controls, we also ran CSP-specific antibodies. But it looked like the antibodies, that whatever the target was, is the same molecular weight as CSP. So we were a bit confused by this. Uh, and maybe it's just a coincidence. So we went on to examine this further by looking for the binding of antibodies to Bergii sporozoites that are coated, that are expressed recombinant for Cipram CSP. And you can see that all of them bound well to these sporozoites. Uh, they bound as well as to wild type for Cipram sporozoites. But in contrast, these antibodies do not bind well to wild type Bergii sporozoites, as shown on the right. All right, so you can see cis three, which really should not bind was the so-called best binder in that. So it's really, I think, background binding, where they clearly bind much better to the, the transgenic pergii. And the only difference between the two is that one expresses falciparum CSP and one does not. Right, so at this point, we thought maybe it is falciparum CSP, but maybe just sporozoite express falciparum CSP and not recombinant CSP. So the recombinant CSP that we Chose, uh, we chose for our screens was expressed by 293 cells, so mammalian cells. And we thought maybe it's just a mammalian cell thing. Let's test uh, other cell types uh, to that, make CS, uh, that we use to make CSP. And basically, the antibodies have not bound to any cell type that we've tried uh, in terms of, well, CSP from any cell type that we've tried. We've tried bacteria, we've tried yeast, we've tried insects, we've tried mammalian. The antibodies don't bind to any of them. And they also don't bind to large peptides covering different regions of CSP. So Sherelle went on to test you know, in, in more detail overlapping peptides covering the entire protein. Uh, basically, they don't bind as well, right? So they seem to bind to sporozoites. They, bind, they seem to bind to sporozoites, produce CSP, but not any form of recombinant CSP or any peptide from CSP that we've managed to find. So we, this is where we are now, right? So we actually still don't know what the target is. Probably CSP, probably sporozoite express CSP, but... It may be a glycan, it may be a confirmational thing. Well, probably not confirmational since the Western blot 
reducing Western blot, it worked, right? So maybe a glycan, maybe something that, so we, we are still investigating this. Right, so we wanted to look at function of these antibodies as well. And uh, so we tested them in this uh, transgenic Bergiai PFCSP model uh, in mice. And we found that there were a few antibodies that could reduce liver burden, although none of them were uh, as potent as cis 3 which we used as a positive control here. Right, so we were interested in 2238, uh, 2146 and red, and then 21101, we only managed to test 100 micrograms in this assay since we didn't have enough of it at that time, but it had some effect. And so we went on to compare the three of them at uh, the same dose, and we found that 21101 uh, was the best of these antibodies in reducing liver burden. Now, we were quite sure at this point that our antibodies don't bind to any classical or canonical CSP epitope including the ones targeted by these three potent antibodies, uh, cis 4 3 L9, and 317, uh, which bind to different parts of CSP, or at least as a major epitope. And so we thought maybe these antibodies can work well in combination with some of uh, these more classical antibodies, since they probably target different sites. Right? And so we went on to perform a combination experiment with our, our best antibody, uh, MAT21101, and I'm just going to focus on the result in red. Here we can see that when we use it in combination with 317, uh, there was a better result than either MET21101 alone or 317 alone, suggesting that there is uh, probably at least additivity when it comes to uh, how these two antibodies work together in this model. All right, so to conclude uh, this section, we've identified uh, potent anti-CSP antibodies, uh, why I described at the start, they bind to the junction of CSP. Um, we also identified 11 uh, unique antibodies that likely bind to falciparum express CSP, but not to recombinant CSP. And a subset of these are functional in reducing liver burden and uh, work cooperatively with at least one known uh, CSP targeting antibody. All right, so this is a bit like our journey to uh, look for non-CSP antibodies, and but we seem to have gotten a bit sidetracked uh, and probably to CSP, right? And so the question is, do all roads lead to CSP? Like no matter how hard we try, does it all end up in CSP? I don't, I don't think so, right? There is evidence, uh, for example, from a Dutch group publishing recently on polyclonal antibodies that non-CSP antibodies can have function uh, against sporozoites. And so I can tell you, we, we are very interested in these 11 antibodies. We're definitely going to follow up on function and the epitope, but we're still also interested in hopefully true uh, non-CSP antibodies. All right, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank our collaborators, right, especially uh, highlighting Cheryl, who did all the non-CSP or you know, non-canonical CSP work. Uh, and Iwe did a lot of the, the little B1 uh, antibody work. And then our colleagues at the VRC helped us with all the functional assays. Uh, we collaborated with groups in, in Kenya and Tanzania and Mali um, to, for, uh, for the cohort analysis. And, and um, the Scripps Research Institute helped with some of the structural work for the spores or antibodies. Right, and I'd like to thank uh, the, our funders, uh, you for your attention, uh, the sample donors, of course, and. Uh, I do have a position for biologists available. If anyone's interested, please email me. All right. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. All right. So I was curious that your MGG4 antibody, when you did the tiling of you know the reactivity, it reacted to not only the repeats but also the C terminus. How do you think that function? How, how do you think that works? So th there is a part, a small sequence in the C terminus that's quite similar to the repeat region. So maybe it reacts against that. We, we haven't really followed up too much in detail about that, but it could be that, right? So they are there, and Heather Wardman has published on this as well, like this. The soft. That's the repeat, repeat, and then there's similar regions like the, the junction, and then the C term has something quite similar as well. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I have a question about um, LAIR domain mutated um, the antibody. So, what makes us 
produce that antibody? Is it like a repeated infection, something like a correlated with age, or is it something that people in the endemic area have? So we've looked at correlation with age. There is no correlation. Even very young children can make it in these areas. So, so it doesn't seem like you need repeated infections. Uh, we've looked at Europeans. Pretty much none of them have it. So it seems like something um, it's found in people who live in the endemic area. So there needs probably needs to be some exposure to the target reference in this case. Uh, yeah. So follow up to that would be: Do you think the ability to make these broadly specific layer containing antibodies provides a clinical advantage. Yeah, so we've done it in two ways. We've looked first in vitro at function, and these antibodies, if you add them to blood stage culture, they don't do anything, but they do uh, enhance phagocytosis, they do enhance ADCC killing of infected red cells. We've looked, and in terms of cohort, uh, for the Kenyan analysis, it was quite difficult to do because they were all adults, so they were all protected pretty much. Uh, we've looked at time to malaria, I think, in the Malian cohort for one year, and we didn't see a correlation there. Right. So I think the problem is that the layer one containing antibodies are broad, but they're not pan red cell reactive. There are a lot of parasites that can probably escape from that. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to ask a question about uh, if you try to use the immunoprecipitate uh, from CSP using a monoclonal or C-terminal antibody that the usually uh, on the surface of C uh, sporozoid, the CSP and terminal processed out, so you're supposed to have a double band, right? Mm. So in that case, you precipitate only CSP, then if you can try to uh, re interact with your non-CSP antibody to see if... Uh, uh, it's only bind to the full length CSP or uh, processed antibody processed CSP. That's what question number one. Mm -hmm. The question number two is, uh, your uh, question is uh, all the way to the CSP. Maybe that's the CSP is the immunodominant protein and most abundant protein of sporozoi. So, based on the your uh, procedure to isolate monoclonal antibody from the protected person is immunizing you uh, live sporozoi, right? Yes. So. Uh, I think uh, the most immunodominant protein may not be the good antigenic uh, candidate for, so dominant uh, may not be the best candidate for the protective antibody, right? So the subdominant may not be the best candidate. Uh, or... Can be, but I think uh, evolutionary uh, point of view, so parasite is supposed to be developed the evasion system for the, the if the dominant protein is highly uh, uh, protective, so it's parasite not survive. But I think it's most abundant protein. Uh, uh, let uh, let the host make a uh, abundant of uh, antibody, but still parasite can infect. Meaning something that was a secret. Uh, the antigen may be the the target be better target than uh, abundant protein. Yeah. So sorry so for a second point. You're saying that a subdominant may be a yeah. better target. Yes. Right, then something that's immunodominant, you can already make lots of antibodies yeah. against it, but still they're not protected. Right. Right. Yeah, so I mean, that I think that was one of the rationales for going after this. And right. you know, we've seen like blood stage RH5, for example, is not immunodominant, but it is, if you can make antibodies against it, it's also that protection. Sorry, your first question, I'm curious, remind me again. Uh, have you ever tried to uh, immunoprecipitate a CSP antibody? From the first from sporozoid and then interact with your non CSP binding antibody. Yes, yeah, so we're going to do that next. Yes, okay. to, to formally show that it is CSP, right? Because now we only have size correlation. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you so much for sharing some of your research, Dr. Tan, and thank you again for taking the time to be with us today.